1 Samuel 29. Very near to the end of the book of 1 Samuel now. And uh, we'll be starting, we still have several, a- after we finish 1 Samuel proper, um, which will be next week, with chapter 31, we're going to spend five weeks. Uh, one week will be uh, a topical message on being a man after God's own heart. And then we'll have four weeks in the Psalms. Other Psalms, recall I, I preached that one message in the Psalms that referenced the events of 1 Samuel. There are actually four more Psalms that reference events in 1 Samuel. So I'm going to preach those four Psalms. Uh, so we have, uh, effectively, including this week, six more weeks in 1 Samuel and uh, surrounding 1 Samuel. Then we'll be jumping into the book of Luke. Next week, we'll be finishing Galatians in the evening. And then we'll be starting a new series in 2 Samuel. We'll just be picking up in 2 Samuel and continuing along in our evening service in 2 Samuel. So I'm excited about what lies ahead for the church and um, the, the different opportunities that we'll have to study some new, uh, new books of the Bible. Throughout the book of 1 Samuel, we have seen on at least two direct occasions, David blatantly lie in order to get himself out of jams which he perceived himself to be in. In each of these circumstances, uh, they've had quite dramatic consequences. And and for all of that, what we don't really see in the scriptures is an outright statement. Um, We don't see in the narrative the direct teaching concerning the nature of lies and the nature of the truth. There are plenty of other passages we can go to to learn of them, and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to see, as we consider the example of David and and how he lied and the consequences of those lies, and then we consider what the Bible says about the consequences of lies and how God sees lying, we're going to understand uh, in a much better way our opportunity, our responsibility to be truthful in every circumstance. And that's what we're going to consider today, the biblical viewpoint on truth. And by God's grace, we'll be able to form through this biblical viewpoint a biblical worldview, a biblical way of thinking, a biblical way of interacting in this world as we consider truth, why it matters, and where we should stand. I've spoken already of the times when David has lied the difficult situations in which he found himself and the the difficult situations that he made for himself through his lies. I'd like to take a few moments, however, just to remember the first of two definitive circumstances. The second one we'll talk about in 1 Samuel 29. But the first of these was in 1 Samuel 21. This is when David went to Nob. He had just fled from Saul, where the temple was located at the time. And he flees to Ahimelech, the high priest, who, remember, if you recall, questions him about his actions. Why are you here? Where is, where is your entourage? And David lies to him, saying in verse 2, as Ahimelech asks him why he's alone, David says, uh, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath sent and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. David tells Ahimelech that he's working for Saul, he's working undercover effectively, and that nobody can know where he is, nobody can know what he's doing, uh, when in fact that's not true at all, is it? In fact, David is fleeing from Saul for his life. Saul wants him dead, Saul wants him caught, and... He lies because he doesn't trust, I suppose, Ahimelech. He gives the impression that to help him, to help David, he tells, as he tells Ahimelech this, he's giving the impression that helping him would be helping Saul. That serving David would be serving the king. Though, in fact, by helping David, Ahimelech is actually effectively, in Saul's eyes, committing treason. Ahimelech does help David, as we recall. He gives him bread, and he gives him Goliath's sword, and David flees into the land of the Philistines. Now we read the consequences of David's lie, not upon himself directly, but upon Ahimelech in chapter 22. The Bible says in verse 16, and then we'll skip to verses 18 and 19, this is the king, Saul, speaking to Ahimelech the high priest. The king says, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy fathers, And then verse 18, And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day 
four score and five, that's 85 persons that did wear a linen ephod, and Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. So Ahimelech, he didn't know that what he was doing was opposing Saul. When Saul calls him before him, Ahimelech says, look, I didn't know. I didn't know that, that I was doing something wrong. This is what David told me. Saul didn't believe him. And Saul told his men to kill the priests. The men would not do it. But Doeg, uh, that, that evil man who uh, had reported David to Saul, was more than happy to do this. And he ended up killing not just the priests, but their families, their wives, their children, and even their animals. The second blatant lie we find is in our text today in 1 Samuel 29. I'm going to work through the text at a very brisk pace this morning, attempting not to overlook anything, but, but I really want us to, to dwell on the nature of truth and just use the text as kind of our foundation. Essential to the event at hand is the context that we, we found in chapter 28, which we considered over the past three weeks, particularly we exposited it three weeks ago. David, recall, was in the land of the Philistines, and he perpetuated this lie that he and his band of 600 men had been going throughout the land of Israel, pillaging and, and burning cities, when in fact he was not going into Israel, he was fighting the Amalekites, and he was fighting the nations around Israel, and he was killing everybody in those cities so that nobody could come back and report to the king of Gath that David was in fact not fighting against Israel, he was fighting against the Canaanites. Achish had believed David to this point and was fully persuaded that David was doing wrong. He, he, was, he was destroying his own people, that now he had made himself, uh, as, as Achish says, stink in the eyes of his own people, and that David was now Achish's servant forever. And so now David was in a really difficult situation. It's a true lose-lose that was brought on by his lie. Recall in, in 1 Samuel 28, the first few verses, David is going to go to battle with Achish against Israel. Philistines are going to battle against Israel. There's no reason why David and his men should not go, right? Achish says, come along with me, and if you fight for me, if you fight with me, then you'll be the captain of my guard, effectively forever. And David can't rightly say no because he's posing as a servant of Achish. And since he has been saying for months now that he's been destroying Israelites, there's no moral reason why he shouldn't go. He's in a real lose-lose. If he didn't fight Saul, if he didn't fight the Philistines, his lie would be discovered and he might end up in danger at the hand of the Philistines. If he did fight Saul, and he did fight Israel, both nations would witness David fighting against his own people. And he would lose all of the goodwill which he had in the land of Israel, and probably the monarchy which God had anointed him unto could never come to pass. And that's where we pick up. In 1 Samuel chapter 29, and I'm going to read the verse, first five verses, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm not going to put them all up on the screen, so if you want to follow along, you'll need to do so in your Bible. I'm going to read the first five verses. The Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Ephek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed, by, uh, passed on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed on in the rare reward with Achish. Then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. And let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? 
Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? So David comes into the camp of the Philistines with Achish and his army in what the K KJV calls the Rere Ward, which is French for rear guard. Or the, so he was in the rear echelon, the, the rear guard of the army. He wasn't up front. He wasn't in the front lines. He was in the rear guard. When he gets there, the other princes of the Philistines are livid at Achish. How dare you bring this Hebrew and his men to fight this battle? Achish insists that David had been upright and loyal, that there's no reason why he should not be in this battle. And as a matter of fact, Achish wants him to fight this battle. He wants to prove him. He wants to see him fight the Israelites. He had no reason to believe that David would, would defect. But the Philistines saw it differently. These princes said, what better way for him to reconcile with his master than to turn on us in the heat of battle and to give us to, to give a, 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 the price of, of the heads of our fellow men as the price of his reconciliation. Of course, they didn't know that Saul had no interest in reconciliation. David's been trying for years now to reconcile, right? He's been doing everything he could to, to be on Saul's side. He's not, he's not trying to, to uh, oppose Saul, but they don't know this, so, so they are, are extremely concerned. They refuse to relent. They refuse to let David and his men fight. So David, David got out of this one, and he doesn't have to fight, but... As we continue, notice what happens in verses 6 through 11. Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered and said, unto, uh, said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us unto this battle. Wherefore now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee. And as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Interesting, David argues with Achish here. As Achish says, I'm sorry, you can't go up with us. David argues with him, stating that he has done nothing to deserve such censure against the battle. And in all honesty, there, there is nothing in the text that would imply that David was not willing to go to battle with them. We can impose upon David the, the, the idea that he didn't want to go to battle. We know that he wasn't actually killing Jews, uh, killing the, the Judites and the Kenites and, and the Israelites in his skirmishes. So we know that he wasn't being overtly hostile against Israel. But he, he paints every picture here. He says to Achish, what, what have I done wrong that, that, that you're not letting me battle against the enemies of my Lord? Either he's completely given up hope here of the monarchy and he's actually thrown in his lot with the Philistines, which we, we know is not the case as we continue to read, or he's keeping up pretenses. And he knows that the Philistine princes are not going to give in. So have, uh, he, he feels comfortable now arguing, right? Fighting to, to, to be allowed to fight um, because he knows that they're not going to let him. And that keeps up pretenses maybe just a little bit better. These instances, these two instances of David lying, 1 Samuel 21 and 1 Samuel 29, are the context within which I would like us to consider the concept of truth this morning. We've considered, as this, this context goes, um, has been laid down, truth and lies. And the first thing we need to understand this morning is that there is such thing as objective and absolute truth. There is such thing as objective and absolute truth. We live in an age and a culture that denies this. Did you know that? I'm sure most of you do. And, and that's why we have to start here. Because our culture, much of it denies objective truth. Much of it denies absolute truth. They state that truth is a relative term which is wholly dependent upon context, point of view, perception, 
amount of knowledge you have, amount of understanding you have. But the problem with this assertion is that it takes a very limited, nature, uh, l limited viewpoint on the nature of truth. And as we consider truth, we can break it up into at least three categories, each commanding a slightly different perspective. There is truth within the context of opinion, there's truth within the context of perception, and there's truth within the context of what I'll say is reality. Truth in the context of opinion is the kind of truth that is, in fact, different for you than it is for me. People will say, see, truth, truth is different for everybody. Your truth is different than my truth, and, and so you need to let me have my truth, and, I, and, I, and then I, I'll let you have your truth. Although it never ends up working that way, does it? As you think of politics, you know, people say, well, your truth is your truth, and that's not my truth, but then they don't want you... They want to impose their truth upon you, right? They don't want you to let you have your own truth. But, but the truth of opinion is, is legitimately a different truth for you than it is for me. We might call this one of the lowercase t truths. If I were to say to you, individually, if I were to line you all up and go to each one of you and say, broccoli is delicious, I'd get some, that is true. I'd get other, that is absolutely not true. This is an opinion, right? This is, this is a truth based upon opinion. Since my assertion is a matter of opinion, your agreement or disagreement is a matter of opinion as well. And since it is entirely based upon opinion, both can be true. I can 100% stand on the truth that broccoli is delicious, while you can 100% stand on the truth that broccoli is, is not delicious, and, and we can agree to disagree because that's your opinion, that's my opinion, and it's, it's based upon our perception, our senses. Truth in the concept of perception, or in the context of perception, is something that is regarded as true, but may not be true. And the reason why we regard it as true, though it's not true, is because of limited knowledge or understanding. Uh, this is another lowercase truth, and we see this in the realm of science all the time, right? The earth was flat because the people that were studying it didn't know any better until they finally knew better. And then we realized the earth is not flat, that it's round. That, I've been reading the last couple of weeks, there's still some people that are struggling with this concept out there. A um, few articles about a few celebrities who are insistent that the earth is flat. But, um, but the earth is round. And look it up. Uh, just the past two weeks, there have been these celebrities that are just, un until you can show me a horizon that curves, I won't believe it. We've been to space. <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson was having a field day with them, by the way. But this is a perception issue, right? This is a perception issue. That we perceive something based upon our limited knowledge. And until we know more, we can't, we, we, we stand on what we do know. That's, that's truth in the way of perception. We, we, we operate in one way until we learn to operate otherwise, until we learn something different. And this is often where the world stops, where culture stops. They stop at opinion and perception. And they say everything is opinion and perception. It's all just in this realm. Your opinion is your opinion. My opinion is my opinion. Your perception is your perception. My opinion my perception is my perception. But it doesn't really work that way. To do so, to stop there, is foolishness. Because there is such thing as absolute truth, objective truth, truth that is real, the reality of things around us. Objective truth, capital T truth, is absolute. Something that is true regardless of you, whether you believe it or not. Something that is true regardless of your perception, regardless of your preference. These truths are everywhere. You don't have to go into the realm of, of God's word to find these truths. But we can go back to science, right? We can prove that the earth is, in fact, round. Uh, that, that, that's true. That you, you don't have to believe it, but, and, and that's your right not to. But it's still true. Gravity, right? Gravity is true whether you choose to believe it or not. You can go to the highest cliff and you can jump off of it because you don't believe in gravity. But gravity is going to convince you pretty quickly that it's real. 
everything that we do in this world is based upon absolute truths. You, you sat down in that chair this morning because you believe that that chair was going to hold you. You believe that that chair is going to hold you because you see it has four legs and you understand your mind can, can recognize how physics works and that those four legs are positioned properly to keep you from falling. When you got into your car this morning and you turned the key, could you imagine if, if there was no such thing as absolute truth, if, if the, the periodic table changed? And so every morning you're wondering what's going to happen when you turn that key. If, con if combustion is the same thing today that it was yesterday, is combustion going to work the same way today when we mix the, the gasoline and the oxygen and, and, and you spark it? Is it going to do the same thing today that it did yesterday? Because if we don't live in a world of absolutes, then I can't, I can't have any confidence in combustion. Every day airplanes fly into the atmosphere. And they are, they are relying upon the fact that aerodynamics do not change. They're relying upon the fact that our atmosphere remains constant. Could you imagine if all of a sudden our atmosphere started fluctuating? If, if daily there was a difference? If the, the, the pull of gravity was different? But see, those things are called in science constants, right? The laws of physics. Things that simply don't change. These are absolutes. There, we, we must understand that there are absolutes. We can see them all around us. The world depends on absolute truth every day simply to function. There are things which are subjective, things which are subject to change, things which are dependent upon opinion or perception, but there are also things which are, without question, absolute. Things which are simply true. They are objective. Two plus two will always equal four regardless of whether we want to believe it or not, regardless of our opinion on the matter or not. And when we speak of, when the Bible speaks of truth, when Jesus Christ came saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, when the Bible says that, the, that it is true, it's using that word, truth, in the capital T, truth form. It is claiming objectivity. It is claiming to be absolute. The Bible takes for granted that when it says something is true, it is objective truth, absolute truth. This is not opinion truth. This is not perception truth. This is absolute truth. This is the whether you believe it or not, it's true kind of truth. Whether you perceive it or not, it's true kind of truth. We can be the kind of people that say, well, I don't believe that book, but that doesn't change the fact that the book is right, that God's word is right. And, excuse me, and that's the premise upon which God exists and upon which he operates. So as we understand that premise, let's walk through some of the principles of truth this morning. I'd like us to walk through an understanding of the nature of truth. And the first thing that we need to understand is that God's word is true. God's word is truth. We'll start right at the, right at the foundation. In Jesus' prayer for us in John 17, he asked this of God in verse 17. Sanctify them, that would be his disciples, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus declared God's word to be truth and then asked God to use his word to set apart, to sanctify those who would follow him. So the question becomes then, what is God's word? Well, pastor, you say God's word is truth. What is God's word? And for this, we consider several other verses. First, we go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, which tells us this. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we see in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 that um, God's word, he spoke, to, he spoke to the world in time past through the prophets. That's what we have written down in our Old Testament, right? Books written by prophets of God. And in these last days, he has spoken unto us by Jesus Christ, by his Son. And we find in the New Testament that the New Testament was written by those called the apostles of Jesus Christ. The representatives of Jesus Christ. Those given the privilege and the responsibility of penning the words of God. We continue in John chapter 1. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
the same was in the beginning with God, verse 2. And it goes on, the scriptures go on to say in verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten son, excuse me, only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 1 tells us that the word was and is God. John 1 verse 14 says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the word of God, and he chose his apostles and prophets to pen his message to us. We add to this our understanding of the Old Testament and New Testament texts called the scriptures in the Bible. And we learn about these scriptures in 2 Timothy th chapter 3, verse 16, which tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God, literally meaning that it's God-breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. The scriptures are the God-given and profitable communication of God to man. That God's word has been given by God directly to man. And in these scriptures, we find testimony that God will preserve his word for every generation. We read this promise in Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, which tells us the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the psalmist tells us that God will always preserve for us he will always communicate to us. He will always keep his words, guard his words, and he will give his words to every generation. The scriptures told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that the scriptures are God-breathed, inspired. We learn from Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 that God has spoken to us through the prophets and through his son and his son through the apostles. As we build this understanding, we recognize that God's word the written word is God's communication to us today. Jesus is the word of God. The scriptures testify of the word, of the preservation and div divine protection of the word. And where we stand from this is that we have been given God's divine communication in the form of his word compiled into what we call our Bibles, which is truth, capital T, truth. Accurate and trustworthy in every context within which it speaks. Now we aren't here to talk specifically about the Bible. If you've been here on Tuesday nights, we've talked about it, right? We've talked about it recently, why we believe what we believe, why we believe we can trust our Bibles, and why we choose to use the King James Bible as opposed to using other translations of the Word of God. We're not going to get into all of that today, uh, um, but I have spoken of it many times. And you can find messages online. You can ask me about it if you have any questions about that. So, absolute truth. The first thing we understand about the nature of truth is that God's word is truth. That this book is truth. That this book is non-negotiable. This, this, this is not an opinion piece. This is God's communication to us. And he's going to hold us accountable to it. If the Bible is not true, then everything that we do here is really a waste, isn't it? If this book is just opinion, if it's just here to make us better people, if it's just here to give us a way, a, a kind of a, a bearing on life, then, then it's kind of a waste of time, isn't it? It's kind of a waste of a time for us just to, just to be listening to a bunch of opinions when I could form opinions on my own. We're not here just to listen to opinions. We're here to listen to God, His Word and His truth. And if we're not here for that, then we're just wasting our time. So we trust God's Word, and we continue to do so. Now that we have established God's Word to be absolute truth, we can move on to the nature of truth in God. We read already in John 17, 17, where Jesus said, Thy word is truth. We established already that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. Consider also His words in John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, this is him speaking to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus claimed to be the truth by which and only through which a man can get to God. Jesus' testimony as well in John 16, 13, he said, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, 
He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus said that he is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit is truth. So Jesus the Son is truth, or God the Son, excuse me, is truth. God the Spirit is truth. And Jesus would say a similar thing, excuse me, John would say a similar thing regarding the Holy Spirit in 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. The Holy Spirit of God is called the Spirit of truth. Jesus Christ was called the truth. So the Son is true. The Spirit is true. What about the Father? Consider Moses' testimony of the Father in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verses 3 and 4. Moses says, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. God the Father called the God of truth. What we find thus is that all three members of the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are all called truth. They are defined as truth. They define truth. If it is God, it is true. If He does it, it is right. If He says it, it is accurate. God is true. And this brings us to the next step. God's Word is true. God is true. Now let's consider the nature of a lie. What does it mean to lie? What is a lie? If God is truth, then a lie can rightly defi be defined as that which is not God, right? Darkness is defined as that which is not light. You can't really define darkness except that it is the absence of light. A lie is simply defined as the absence of the truth. Where, the, where, where truth is absent, you have a lie. We find in two contexts in the New Testament the reality that God cannot lie. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, the Bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. So Hebrews 6, 18 says it, that in, in these two unchanging things, which we won't get into today, it was impossible for God to lie. In Titus 1, 2, the scriptures tell us in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. And it talks about, continues to talk about eternal life. God cannot lie. Moses said it as well. God cannot have iniquity. And the reason why God cannot lie is because God is truth. If God does it, then it is true. If God doesn't do it, then it is not the truth. We read this explicitly in 1 John 2.21, where the Bible says, I have not written unto you because ye know the truth, but because ye, kn but be because ye have, uh, know not the truth, excuse me, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. If it is true, it is not a lie. If it is a lie, it is not of the truth. And if it is not of the truth, then it is not of God, right? If it is not of the truth, then it is a lie. If it's not of the truth, it's not of God, because God is truth. Now consider the nature of a holy God. As we present the gospel, we regularly speak of the reality that it is our sin that has separated us from God, right? Our sin has separated us from fellowship with God. That a holy God cannot have intimate fellowship with unholy creatures. Because God is the essence of all that is right. He is the definition of right. He is the definition of true. He is the definition of holy. He is utterly opposed to all that is not in Him. And if He is a God of truth, then we can know without question that He is opposed to that which is untrue. And in fact, this is what we find in scriptures. God hates untruth. God hates lies. 
In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, the Bible says this, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to, in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth dith, discord among the brethren. In these, this list of seven things that God hates from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, lying is mentioned twice, isn't it? First time being a lying tongue, the second time a false witness that speaketh lies. There's a, a nuance of difference, one of them um, being a false witness, so speaking lies about another, the other one simply um, telling an, uh, an untruth. These tellers of untruths are joined by other sins that God hates and calls abominable. Within that list, murder, pride, dissension as things which God truly hates. But lying is in that list twice. We often think of lying as such a small thing, right? Such a little thing. I'm not going to hurt anybody. It's just, it's just lying. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, right? The ways that God, we could try to go about getting, getting what we believe to be God's will our way or what we want our way instead of God's way. And one of the ways that we often are tempted to do that is by lying. Maybe it's cheating on a test or on a project for, for those of you that are school age. Maybe it's cheating on your taxes for those of you that are no longer school age. Maybe it's misrepresenting your income or misrepresenting your employment uh, or, or misrepresenting your, your history or, or um, misrepresenting yourself uh, before um, uh, friends or, or family. Misrepresenting how you've, how you've used money that you've borrowed from someone. Whatever it might be, we're tempted to lie. And we say, it's not hurting anybody. It's, it's, just, it's just me trying to get a little bit of an advantage. Twice in this list of seven sins, God talks about lying. God hates it as much as he hates murder. As much as he hates dissension. We read again in Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly are his delight. This word abomination is excessively strong in the Hebrew language, used to describe those things which God deems to be morally detestable. Other sins called an abomination in the text. We talked about the seven in Proverbs 6. Idolatry is called an abomination. Sodomy is called an abomination. Things that we would, we would look at and, and, and we would say, yes, God doesn't like those things. And yet... Oftentimes we kind of give ourselves a pass on that lying thing, don't we? But this is the level of wickedness which God ascribes to lying. Because it is 100% directly opposed to his character. It is everything, a lie is everything that God is not. In the worst of ways. So we begin to understand the extreme importance of the truth. And to this end, the extreme importance of God's word. Without truth, there can be no objectivity. There can be no purpose. We flounder in the mi misery of a meaningless existence if we don't have truth. The psalmist would say in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 130, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. The word of God is the means by which we access truth. We access that objective standard by which we can live our lives. It gives us our purpose. It gives us the, the framework within which we are able to operate. Everything that we talk about every week, when we say we ought to, we ought not to, we ought to do these things, we ought not do these things, it is all our attempt as a church to live within the framework, within the boundaries that God has given to us. And the boundaries that he's given to us is him, his character, who he is. That is truth. The word of God is the truth of God. And the entrance of the word of God into the heart of man is the entrance of truth into man. When a man accepts this truth, the truth illuminates him to reality to objectivity, to, to what is real. 
and enables him to see himself and the world around him within the context of reality. This is why as the apostle seeks to describe the depraved nature of man, he describes them within the context of those who have rejected God and rejected God's truth. Paul would say this in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. Because, and he's describing the unbeliever here, he says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The Bible says that the sinner, the unbeliever, when they reject God, They take everything and they turn it on his head. They take that which is right and they make it wrong. And they take that which is wrong and they make it right. We see this in society today. I mean, it's everywhere today. They change the truth that is God's word. And they change the the objective truth and they make it a lie. And pursue the lies of their own hearts as if they are true. And so they build their entire foundation upon the lies of this world. And they operate as if those lies are true. And in doing so, it hurdles them into the abyss of moral depravity and misery and wickedness. Paul goes on to say in verses 28 through 32, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. When they, the, the more God is removed from their mind, the more wickedness makes its way in. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. It's an interesting one in that list, huh? Without understanding, covenant breakers, Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is the legacy of those who reject truth. This is the legacy of those who reject God and his word. The wickedness that is in the world comes from a rejection of truth. And the wickedness that the world is lost in, the wars, the deceit, the lies, the dishonesty, the power struggles, the vanity, the greed, and the lust, and the unfaithfulness, the depravity, the violence, the anger, it's all rooted in rejection of truth. Now, we've gone through a large amount of scripture today, and I've sought to walk you, I've start, sought to start at the beginning and to walk you through foundationally what truth is and why truth is so important. But the question becomes where do we stand in all of this? By we, I mean we who have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. If you've never accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you, you have never accepted the most important truth that is in this world. That Jesus Christ died for you. That you are a sinner. That there's no way you can get yourself right with God. There's no way you can get yourself to heaven. There's no way you can can on your own be right with God. But that God sent his only begotten son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. To take your punishment for your sin on himself. When he died he paid for your sin. When he rose again on the third day he conquered sin and death. So that if you place your full faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ... Not only will the the bonds of sin, the power of sin be broken in your life so that you can do right, but you are reserved a home in heaven and a place in fellowship with God for eternity. If you've not accepted that truth, that's the foundation. The Bible says that they which are in the flesh cannot please God, but they that that are, are 
in the flesh cannot understand the things of the Spirit. If you've never accepted Christ, then, then you can't even fully grasp truth. Objective truth. Many people, and I'm sure many in this room, could testify that when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's like, oftentimes people say, like scales fell from your eyes. Like all of a sudden, everything changed. You saw the world differently. Uh, all, th there was a brand new perspective on life. Whereas you used to think this way, now, now you, you took a 180 degree turn and you're thinking entirely differently now. Life is different. Priorities are different. Desires are different. What changed? The entrance of truth. And now that you have a baseline by which to operate, everything changes. Because now you've accepted truth. And now you can see the world the way it really is. You can see things for how it truly is. But for we who are believers, you're the child of God. You're the child of the God of truth. You have been called out of this world to be a visible manifestation of the truth of God into the world that is filled with lies. Your relationship to the truth is essential in this. It is an essential element of your relationship with God and your testimony to the world. As such, the Bible makes it clear that those who love God love truth. Psalm 119, 163 says, I hate and abhor lying, but in contrast, thy law do I love. If you're a follower of God through Jesus Christ, God expects you to live a life that is defined by that which is true. Not because it will always be the most convenient way to live. Sometimes it's pretty convenient to lie. Not because it will always make people happy. Sometimes lying to a person is what emotionally will make them happiest. Right? My wife comes in, she says, how do I look today? And she has broccoli in her teeth and she, her hair's all over the place and, and she's about to walk out the door. Now I could say, hey honey, you look great today. And she could walk out that door feeling content that she looks good until she finds out that I lied to her, right? Or I could do the, the kind thing and say, honey, you've got some problems that you need to get fixed here before you leave. Now, she may not like to hear that, but she'll be so thankful <laughs> that I told her what she needed to hear before she left the house. May not be the best illustration, but drives the point. We need to be loyal to the truth. Not because it's always most convenient or it'll make people happiest, but because you love what God loves. You hate what God hates. God loves truth. And he hates lying. And this is what it comes down to. Hating lying, abhorring that which is untrue because you love God and because God is truth. Untruth mocks, lies, mock the true and living God. Scorn the character of the one who created us. All throughout the New Testament, Paul would give testimony of the fact that one of the most basic definitions of a follower of Christ is that you tell the truth. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man and his deeds. He says, if you are no longer a person who is walking dead in your your sin. If you are no longer that old man, well then get rid of the lying and speak truth. Because that's what a believer does. Because we love God. And God is a God of truth. He would say the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. If you're a believer, you ought to tell the truth. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us that the very greatest of Christian virtues is charity, love. He would tell us in Galatians that love is the fulfillment of the law of God. Jesus stated that the whole law is comprehended in this one statement, Thou shalt love thy neighbor uh, as thyself. And in Paul's definition of love, the, the kind of love, that charity, that is God's love, he says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 6. That charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Love rejoices in truth. Christ-like love rejoices in truth. To this end, love, the fulfillment of the law, that which is defined as Christ, 
demands truth. All of this leads us to a definitive statement. The mature and consistent disciple of Jesus Christ will show tireless devotion to the truth in every aspect of his worldview and every aspect of his life, both public and private. The mature and consistent disciple of Jesus Christ will show tireless devotion to the truth in every aspect of his worldview and every aspect of his life, both private and public. Why private as well? Because truth knows no bounds. You may be doing something in the privacy of your own home that is not true and nobody else is there to see you lie or see you cheat or see you uh, deceive, but God does. And this is why it's so important for us to understand that this is between you and God, folks. This is about you reflecting God. This is about the nature of God and how you relate to Him. Because God is truth and God hates lying. We have men, women, and children in this room today at various places of your Christian life, living different lives according to what you know to be right. But one of the things that, not just should, one of the things that must define every Christian in this room, every Christian under the sound of my voice, it must define you, is that you love truth, that you tell the truth, that you live a life of truth. This means you don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't represent yourself as something that you're not. Children, you don't lie to your parents. You don't lie to your teachers. Adults, you don't lie to your boss. You don't lie to the government. Parents, you don't lie to your children. And you don't lie to your spouse. This devotion to the truth, as we have mentioned already, is not to be only due to convenience or benefit. There might be a physical benefit to cheating on a test if you don't get caught, if you don't get caught. There might be a physical benefit to cheating on your time clock if you don't get caught. There might be a physical benefit to falsifying the records on your taxes if you don't get caught. But the problem with this is twofold. First, and least important, is that if you perpetuate lies, eventually you will get caught. That's the least important part, point, though. That, that's, that's, that's down here. Second, and exponentially more important than that, is that God hates lying. You cannot walk in fellowship with God if you are living a life of dishonesty. You open yourself up to all manner of spiritual deception and oppression. You fall short of God's capacity to spiritually bless you and for the Holy Spirit of God to work through you. You should fall short of the capacity to, to find victory over sin. May, maybe it is that you've not had victory over a certain area of sin in your life and you've wondered why and you've, you've searched your life for sin, but you know, you've kind of ignored that lying thing. Maybe that's why. You fall short of having a proper testimony of the world around you. And this is the other operative issue, folks. If, if this is the truth... But the world, as described in Romans chapter 1, has changed the truth of God into a lie and worships the creature rather than the creator. And we have a world out there that, that everything that's wrong is right and everything that's right is wrong. How can the world learn truth if we yield it? If we who are children of the God of truth yield truth, if we show a willingness to lie, and the world around us sees us lying, sees us living a lie, sees us living contrary to the truth, then what's going to convince them of the truth? We're just taking our own light and we're snuffing it out. We're hiding it under the bushel, as Jesus would say. And he says that if we're the light of the world, we don't hide under a bushel, we're put on a candlestick so everyone can see. To live the light of the truth of God's word. Truthfulness is foundational to biblical Christianity. If you want to be like Christ, then you need to tell the truth. And you need to love the truth. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you that we have it in your word. Thank you that we can live it. Thank you that you have called us out of uh, the world of error and deceit into lives of clarity and truth.
pray for everyone in this room this morning. I pray for any who are not believers. Think uh, of our, our young people, some of whom um, have not accepted Christ and perhaps others. I ask that you would help them to submit themselves to that truth above all. And then I pray for we who are believers in this room at various stages of our Christian growth and understanding. But I, I ask that every one of us would understand the essential nature of truth. For your honor and your glory, for your sake, as well as our own. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.